Hi, I'm Kiwis Romai, the citizen of Rome, here to participate in Bossman 103's Read a Book, Don't Burn One campaign, launched in retaliation to Thunderfoot's Koran burning crusade. Because Thunderfoot wants to burn books in the name of free speech. Go figure! Now I encourage anyone and everyone who agrees that Thunderfoot has gone too far to participate. All you have to do is pick a book, any book, and read an excerpt into the camera. Post your video response to Bossman's video, for which I'll provide a link. Today, I'll be reading a story from Bullfinch's Mythology. This is the Greek story of how Dionysus, or Bacchus to give him his Roman name, came to be. Bacchus was the son of Jupiter and Semele. Juno, to gratify her resentment against Semele, contrived a plan for her destruction. Assuming the form of Beroe, her aged nurse, she insinuated doubts whether it was indeed Jove himself who came as a lover. Heaving a sigh, she said, I hope it will turn out so, but I can't help being afraid. People are not always what they pretend to be. If he is indeed Jove, make him give some proof of it. Ask him to come arrayed in all his splendor, such as he wears in heaven. That will put the matter beyond doubt. Semele was persuaded to try the experiment. She asks a favor without naming what it is. Jove gives his promise and confirms it with the irrevocable oath, attesting the river Styx, terrible to the gods themselves. Then she made known her request. The god would have stopped her as she spake, but she was too quick for him. The words escaped, and he could neither unsay his promise nor her request. In deep distress, he left her and returned to the upper regions. There he clothed himself in his splendors. Arrayed in this, he entered the chamber of Semele. Her mortal frame could not endure the splendors of the immortal radiance. She was consumed to ashes. Now here, Bullfinch actually leaves out a detail. Zeus actually rescues Dionysus' uh, embryo and inserts it into his thigh. Dionysus is then later born from the thigh. Jove took the infant Bacchus and gave him in charge to the Nicene nymphs who nourished his infancy and childhood, and for their care were rewarded by Jupiter by being placed as the Hyades among the stars. When Bacchus grew up, he discovered the culture of the vine and the mode of extracting its precious juice. But Juno struck him with madness and drove him forth, a wanderer through various parts of the earth. In Phrygia, the goddess Rhea cured him and taught him her religious rites, and he set out on a progress through Asia, teaching the people the cultivation of the vine. As he approached his native city, Thebes, Pentheus, the king, who had no respect for the new worship, forbade its rites to be performed. But when it was known that Bacchus was advancing men and women, but chiefly the latter, young and old, poured forth to meet him and to join his triumphal march. It was in vain Pentheus remonstrated, commanded, and threatened. Go, he said to his attendants, seize this vagabond leader of the rout and bring him to me. I will soon make him confess his false claim of heavenly parentage and renounce his counterfeit worship. It was in vain his nearest friends and wisest counselors remonstrated and begged him not to oppose the god. The remonstrances only made him more violent. But now the attendants returned, whom he had dispatched to seize Bacchus. They had been driven away by the Bacchanals, but had succeeded in taking one of them prisoner, whom, with his hands tied behind him, they brought before the king. Pentheus, beholding him with wrathful countenance, said, Fellow, you shall speedily be put to death, that your fate may be a warning to others. But though I grudge the delay of your punishment, speak. Tell us who you are, and what are these new rites you presume to celebrate. The prisoner, unterrified, responded, My name is Acetes. My country is Maeonia. My parents were poor people who had no fields or flocks to leave me, but they left me their fishing rods and nets in their fishermen's trade. This I followed for some time, till growing weary of remaining in one place, I learned the pilot's art, 
and how to guide my course by the stars. It happened as I was sailing for Delos, we touched at the island of Dia and went ashore. Next morning I sent the men for fresh water, and myself mounted the hill to observe the wind. When my men returned, bringing with them a prize, as they thought, a boy of delicate appearance whom they have found asleep, they judged he was a noble youth, perhaps a king's son, and they might get a liberal ransom for him. I observed his dress, his walk, his face. There was something in them which I felt sure was more than mortal. I said to my men, What god there is concealed in that form I know not, but someone there certainly is. Pardon us, gentle deity, for the violence we have done you, and give success to our undertakings. Dictus, one of my best hands for climbing the mast and coming down by the ropes, and Melanthus, my steersman, and Epopius, the leader of the sailor's cry, one and all exclaimed, Spare your prayers for us! So blind is the lust of gain. This ship shall not be profaned by such impiety, said I. I have a greater share in her than any of you. But Lycabus, a turbulent fellow, seized me by the throat and attempted to throw me overboard. And I scarcely saved myself by clinging to the ropes. The rest approved the deed. Then Bacchus, for it was indeed he, as if shaking off his drowsiness, exclaimed, What are you doing with me? What is this fighting about? Who brought me here? Where are you going to carry me? One of them replied, Fear nothing. Tell us where you wish to go, and we will take you there. Naxos is my home, said Bacchus. Take me there, and you shall be well rewarded. They promised to do so, and told me to pilot the ship to Naxos. Naxos lay to the right, and I was trimming the sails to carry us there, when some by signs and others by whispers signified to me their will that I should sail in the opposite direction and take the boy to Egypt to sell him for a slave. I was confounded and said, Let someone else pilot the ship, withdrawing myself from any further agency in their wickedness. They cursed me, and one of them, exclaiming, Don't flatter yourself that we depend on you for our safety, took my place as pilot, and bore away from Naxos. Then the god, pretending that he had just become aware of their treachery, looked out over the sea and said in a voice of weeping, Sailors, these are not the shores you promised to take me to. Yonder island is my home. What have I done that you should treat me so? It is small glory that you will gain by cheating a poor boy. I wept to hear him, but the crew laughed at both of us, and sped away the vessel fast over the sea. All at once, strange as it may seem, it is true, the vessel stopped in the mid-sea as fast as if it was fixed to the ground. The men, astonished, pulled at their oars and spread more sail, trying to make progress by the aid of both, but all in vain. Ivy twined round the oars and hindered their motion and clung to the sails with heavy clusters of berries. A vine, laden with grapes, ran up the mast and along the sides of the vessel. The sound of flutes was heard, and the odor of fragrant wine spread all around. The god himself had a chaplet of vine leaves, and bore in his hand a spear wreathed with ivy. Tigers crouched at his feet, and forms of lynxes and spotted panthers played around him. The men were seized with terror or madness. Some leaped overboard. Others, preparing to do the same, beheld their companions in the water undergoing a change, their bodies becoming flattened and ending in a crooked tail. One exclaimed, What miracle is this? And as he spoke, his mouth widened, his nostrils expanded, and scales covered all his body. Another, endeavoring to pull the oar, felt his hands shrink up and presently to be no longer hands but fins. Another, trying to raise his arms to a rope, found he had no arms and curving his mutilated body, jumped into the sea. What had been his legs became the two ends of a crescent-shaped tail. The whole crew became dolphins and swam about the ship, now upon the surface, now under it, scattering the spray and spouting the water from their broad nostrils. Of twenty men, I alone was left. Trembling with fear, the god cheered me. Fear not, he said. Steer towards Naxos. I obeyed, and when we arrived there, 
I kindled the altars and celebrated the sacred rites of Bacchus. Pentheus here exclaimed, We have wasted time enough on this silly story. Take him away and have him executed without delay. Acetes was led away by the attendants and shut up fast in prison. But while they were getting ready the instruments of execution, the prison doors came open of their own accord, and the chains fell on his limbs. Pentheus would take no warning, but instead of sending others, determined to go himself to the scene of the solemnities. The mountain Scytheron was all alive with worshippers, and the cries of the Bacchanals resounded on every side. The noise roused the anger of Pentheus, as the sound of a trumpet does the fire of a warhorse. He penetrated through the woods and reached an open space where the chief scene of the orgies met his eyes. At the same moment the women saw him, the first among them his own mother, Agave, blinded by the god, cried out, See there, the wild boar, the hugest monster that prowls in these woods. Come on, sisters, I will be the first to strike the wild boar. The whole band rushed upon him, and while he now confesses his crime and implores pardon, they press upon him and wound him. In vain he cries to his aunts to protect him from his mother. Atanoe seized one arm, Eno the other, and between them he was torn to pieces, while his mother shouted, Victory, victory, we have done it! The glory is ours! So the worship of Bacchus was established in Greece.